Uh, so we're going to be in Philippians chapter 4 this morning. It's on page 953. 953. We're finishing our study in Philippians, living a worthy life. Living a worthy life. What does that mean? We've been asking ourselves. And today, we'll continue to, we'll continue to investigate what that means. Before we do that, I would like to just pose a simple quest to, a question to you, a, a short little test. How many emotions can you name? How many emotions can you name? How many emotions can you describe? I looked it up, and you know, according to one website, it said like there are 27 distinct emotions. Now, I didn't look to see what counts as a distinct emotion, but somewhere somebody said there are 27. And you know, I, I would imagine maybe, maybe that's kind of a culturally bound understanding of what emotions are or even how to describe emotions. And when you think about how some people who may be, you know, dealing with maybe some neurotypical or neuroatypical um, cognitive uh, situations in life, you know, we think about people who are on the autism spectrum who struggle to identify emotions vis visibly. They have, they have like flashcards with pictures of people's faces on them. So they can uh, learn to associate expressions with emotions so that they can better communicate with other people. And I was like, oh, that's really, that's, that's really, really helpful. Helping people who may be you know, neuroatypical or neurodivergent understand and uh, as well you know, communicate, as, as well as helping people who, who may not deal with, with those kind of uh, setbacks or those kind of obstacles understand their life as well. The reason why I brought that up, uh, that little test, you know, how many emotions can you name, um, is that the book of Philippians is a very emotional letter. Emotions are all over the place. Even the theme of our letter, living a worthy life, what it looks like for us as followers of Jesus to live a worthy life according to the faith that we have, isn't tied up with our emotions. Now, that doesn't mean that they're contingent on it, so that only when you feel this way you should do something, but we have seen how rejoicing, some, some cultures and contexts interpret that as celebrate, not just sort of a, oh, I'm happy about this, but to actually celebrate. That is an emotional response. Similarly, to serve one another without grumbling or complaining. Eventually what happens is that when you start to consider other people better or more important than yourselves, you consider their needs, your emotions start to change. Now we know that in our life, sometimes there is a disconnect between our emotions and what we know to be true. For example, we know that God will provide for us, but sometimes our emotions tell us otherwise. Or we, we believe, we want to believe that God loves us, but maybe our emotions, again, sort of conflict with that. And becoming emotionally aware as you read your Bible is a very helpful thing. Also to realize that the people who wrote the Bible were emotional people. They weren't robots. They weren't brains on sticks who wrote complex theological arguments, but they were people who loved. They were people who were friends with one another. They were people who feared. And so as we continue and conclude our lesson in Philippians, we're in this place where the, the, uh, the subject of emotions gets brought up once again. The title of it is like so many emotions. The imprisoned Paul is concluding his writing. He's um, He's received the financial gift that the church in Philippi has given them through the messenger Epaphroditus. And remember, in those days, when you went to prison, the, the stuff that you went to prison, the clothes you went to, the clothes you were wearing when you went to prison, that's what you wore. You were left to yourself. You were left to your friends and family to provide for you. There wasn't a cafeteria where a government-funded meal was given. You were at the mercy of your friends and family to care for you. 
And that's what the church in Philippi has done for Paul. They have been showing their love for him through tangible and material needs. And Paul, now at this point in this letter, he's, he's sort of tying everything back together. He wants them to, to remember, hey, remember how Epaphr- you sent Epaphroditus to me with this gift. And Epaphroditus, he got so sick that he almost died. But now that he's better, I'm sending him back to you. And the fact that I'm sending him back to you makes me happy because he's going to have the opportunity to tell you how I am so Joyful. I am so thankful for how our relationship, though separated by hundreds and hundreds of miles and prison bars, is still able to continue. He is able to share with them how he is able to rejoice in the Lord because this gift reminds him that the church in Philippi hasn't forgotten him. They still care about him and they're still working with him. So I'll read chapter 4, verses 10 through 20, just so we can get a sense of the argument as a whole. Not even an argument, as that, that's the wrong word, as an encouragement. But if you would like to follow along with me, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord, that at last you had an opportunity to renew your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, you as Philippians know that in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church, not one, shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and more than enough and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering and an acceptable, pleasing sacrifice to God. And my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To God our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And may that be true for us as well, that as we think about how God has provided for us, may he receive the praise. So, as Paul starts out this passage, he almost sounds like an ungrateful friend, right? He has this really weird way of showing his appreciation. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you had renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I was in need. Have you ever spent a lot of time thinking about a gift to give somebody? You know, maybe as a parent, you work really, really hard to put together something special for your child. Now, I know this... this This illustration doesn't happen here. You worked really, really hard to maybe provide for them or to give them something special for their birthday. And what's their thanks? Well, they don't really say thanks at all. Maybe they complain about the gift. Or maybe you work on something really, really hard for your friends. Like, you know your friends really well. You know what would be really special for them. Or maybe there's like a crush that you have, and so you get them something special for their birthday. And their response is, thanks, but I don't really need this. You ever had that situation where this is a big deal, but they're just like, yeah, yeah, it's it's fine, whatever. Or think about it, not just a gift, but maybe it's like a life-saving gift. Could you imagine rushing into a burning house, dragging somebody out there at your your own, like, life, the cost of your life, potentially, and as you revive them and you wait for the, you know, the, the EMS, the emergency services to get there, they're coughing and clearing out their lungs. <coughs> Thank you. But I would have made it out eventually. 
by myself. What's the deal? Why is Paul raining on their parade? Why is he saying, thanks for your gift, but I didn't really need it? Is Paul an ungrateful person? Is there drama? Yeah, thanks for the gift, but how come this didn't get here sooner? You know, a nice little passive aggressive comment. Oh, it's like, it's so brave of you to, to give me this gift. I think we all have friends like that as well, and maybe we are that person. Or is Paul, as, as some people just automatically assume, is Paul just an awkward person who doesn't know how to show his appreciation? Well, in this first section, this, as Paul is saying this, Paul realizes, like many of us, that money has a tremendous ability to influence a relationship, either positively or negatively. The way that money is used in relationships can really, really mess things up. And we know that in the context of the letter of Philippians, it's all about a relationship, a friendship that has been forged and through suffering has been strengthened. And so Paul is basically saying here, listen, I don't want you to think that I'm using you. I don't want you to think that the only thing I care about in our relationship is how you provide for me. And I think maybe we know people who are like that, who are only take, 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 take. Maybe that's our experience with maybe some Christian ministries or some pastors where it just kind of seems like they're always asking you for money or they want you to give. Paul wants them to know, even in this weird way, that this relationship isn't just about money for them, even though they have provided for him. They've, they've in some cases, almost, you could say, saved his life or made his life more bearable. He doesn't want them to feel used. But he also doesn't want them to, to, you know, maybe feel that now that they've given money to him, he sort of is in their debt to do and say whatever he wants. You know, money can really, really control people. Like, if I give you money, isn't there this expectation that you will spend it a certain way? So there's, there's a tension that Paul has to deal with here. I don't want you to feel used, but also I don't want to feel controlled by you. So there's that reality, but also Paul wants them to realize something even deeper. Their money, what they do with their money, and giving it to Paul is actually an act of worship for them. Later on in the chapter, you'll see verses 17 and 18, as much as he appreciates this gift, he wants them to know that they are able to benefit more from this gift, the giving of this gift, than the person who gets it. I think many of us know that old, you know, the old adage, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And yeah, that, that's true, although that's a hard thing to believe sometimes. But ultimately, what Paul is reminding here in Philippi is that even what they do with their money is an act of worship for them. And when they worship God with their money, sacrificing, Paul says, it's going to be paid back to you. More is going to be given to your account more more than this is helpful for me and it's just a quick little lesson i think that sometimes we forget i know i forget a lot that everything that we have been called to do as image bearers of god is meant to reflect that relationship to represent how we represent god in this world as well as how we turn back in praise to god so even the way that we use our money can be seen as an act of worship. And God honors that. So Paul goes on to say, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever circumstance. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every and any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all of this through him who gives me strength. Paul says he learned the lesson to be content. If you've ever studied advertising, you might notice an interesting shift that happened post-World War II. Prior to World War II, and this, you know, I'm dealing in generalities. You could always probably find an exception to this. By and large, advertising pre-World War II was based around this idea of we want to satisfy a need that you have to have the best. So whatever we're trying to sell you, we're trying to sell you this because it's the best version of what it is that you need. 
And it's, it was kind of interesting. I was listening to a podcast about this a couple of years ago. And they, they, one of the ways they sort of like reinforce this idea of this is the best of something is to tie up the name of, of uh, products with scientific sounding um, names or ideas of like purity or cleanliness. And the example that they gave was Hydrox cookies. Now, you guys might not know what Hydrox cookies are, but they are basically Oreo's older brother. Hydrox cookie was invented first. And do you notice how they, they use like something that almost sounds like a cleaning agent, like a purity agent to say this cookie is really good because of the purity of the ingredients that we are using. These are the best ingredients. And now as time has gone on, Hydrox, you guys may not even, again, may not even know. I remember growing up and going to Dairy Queen and I wanted an Oreo Blizzard. If they didn't have Oreos, but they had a Hydrox cookies, I could taste the difference. Let me tell you this. Even though Hydrox came out first and had a more scientific name and is no longer considered the better of the sandwich cookie, that's a digression I can get into for a really long time. But really what happened is there was a shift from we are giving you the best version of something to we are satisfying a need. We are satisfying a need for you. And interestingly enough, one of the main proponents of shifting this uh, expectation and advertising from we want to give you the best version of something to we want to satisfy a need for something was Sigmund Freud's grandson. Isn't that interesting? One of the most influential psychologists, psychotherapists in all of Western history, his grandson or one of his descendants shifted advertising into making us feel like we will not be content unless we have this product shifting us to a consumer culture. And I don't think that I need to spend a lot of time to try and convince you. If you were to look at advertisements, look how maybe sometimes subtly, maybe sometimes right in your face, how there's this message that unless you have our product, you won't be able to sort of, again, how would you, how would, if you had a flashcard of contentment, what would, the, what would the look look like? If you could, maybe if it was like a GIF, you know, kind of like a, a moving thing, the ability to just kind of breathe and say, ah, I'm okay. That's how I imagine contentment. Advertising is you can't let out that breath to say, I'm okay unless I buy their product, join their movement, embrace the definition of whatever it is that they're trying to do. And we all sort of know that with the advent of social media, how that's just only made things worth with FOMO, the fear of missing out, that unless I have this, unless I am there, unless I follow this cultural belief, lock, step, and barrel, I am going to miss out. And so we just, again, we've seen socially just in the past five to ten years with the advent of social media and how people are just able to sort of put out this persona of themselves, it actually leads to a sense of despair, a sense of a lack of contentment that leads to despair. I've been reading a book by a pastor and author by the name of Jay Kim called Analog Christian. And he talks about this idea and he labels it self-centric despair instead of contentment. Self-centrism is the unremitting gaze inward, an inability to see life as anything more than the comparative background to the foreground of our own thoughts, feelings, and perceptions of experience. So we can't understand our own experience, our own value, our own worth, apart from measuring up to other people. So seeing how people put themselves forward on Instagram and TikTok and, and you know, hacks for this and style for that. And what happens is that when we see the, the most curated, edited, uh, airbrushed version of something, we automatically assume that unless I measure up to that, I'm worth nothing. And it leads to self-centric despair or discontentment. And again, what, what would discontentment look like? If contentment looks like, <sighs> I'm okay. What does discontentment look like? Maybe if you think about it, you're wearing something that's too tight or it's itchy and you just can't stop moving. You just can't come to a place where you're able to rest. 
I think many of us understand that feeling, that, that feeling of, I just, I just can't, I just, I just got to get through this. Even as Christians, we know that we are not immune from a feeling of discontent of, I've just got to get through this week, and then I can relax. Or if, if God could just do this, if God could just show up in this way, then I know I'm going to be okay. Paul says he learned the secret to being content. Just imagine to yourself, what would that look like? If Paul were to host a seminar, The Secret of Being Content, how quickly would you buy tickets for that? How quickly would it sell out? If he had a YouTube channel, what would the thumbnail of his secret of contentment look like? Have you ever noticed nowadays YouTube thumbnail channels, like the, the thing that gets you to click on it, everybody just really looks like the most extreme version of something? What would the extreme version of contentment look like? What does Paul's contentment look like here? Is it a detached emotional state? We think about other religions and philosophies in this world where we think about Buddhism, where one of the main tenets and teachings is that suffering is caused by desire. And so if you can remove yourself from that, you will come to a better state. Or maybe it's something that we would consider like a holy stoicism. Stoicism is a philosophy that was really, really popular around Paul's day, where, among other things, the, one of the main teachings of stoicism is that if you just think logically and remove yourself emotionally from certain situations, you will have a happier life. Because you will realize that this world is all that there is, and so there's no sense of getting worked up about something. And how do we as Christians do that? Well, I think one of the ways that we do that, we portray a holy stoicism, is we try not to let the things of this world bother us too much. We try to separate ourselves from the cares of this world. Maybe we, we dress it up in Christian language. We dress it up with certain passages of the Bible that that sort of help us feel like, oh, this world is not my home. Heaven is my home. And we sort of take what the Bible is teaching when it talks about heaven being our home as a place far away from this world where we will exist in some sort of disembodied spiritual bliss forever. When in reality, that's not the teaching. That's not what the Bible is talking about when it says that heaven is our home. But I know that I've covered that before. And if you have any questions about what that means, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Maybe Paul's contentment is just coming from a, a mental decision. You know what? I'm going to look on the bright side of things. I'm going to be, choose to be thankful. It, maybe it's just I'm going to make the best out of a bad situation. My being in prison means that the guards will be able to hear the gospel. If I die, I'll go and be with the Lord. And again, there, there, there is part of that, and we all know that Focusing on, overly focusing on negative things emotionally, physically, physically, psychologically brings us down. If you doubt that, hang out with somebody who's always pointing out something that's wrong. It gets really tiring. So there, there's certainly a part of that. But ultimately what happens is that if we just sort of, if we just say, oh, that's just what it is. It's just an attitude of choosing to be grateful for something or looking on the bright side. Eventually, the extreme character of Christians become people who are not concerned about the cares of this world. And, and we're, we're supposed to be these emotionless people who are detached from real life situations. You know that meme that was popular a couple of years ago and the fact that somebody who's over 40 is talking about it automatically means it's a dead meme, so I understand. But the, the, picture, the, the picture of the cartoon dog sitting in a kitchen that's on fire, and he's just sitting there with a smile on his face saying, this is fine. I think sometimes what happens is that we as Christians subliminally, subconsciously, or maybe, maybe even explicitly are taught this idea of contentment is to pretend that everything is okay. And for us to be content, then we just have to say, this is fine. But that's not contentment. No, Paul, what he's talking about when he says he has learned to be content is not a detached stoicism. It's not a detached holy stoicism or choosing to look on the bright side, but rather it is a learned spiritual discipline 
that is anchored and energized in Christ's resurrection power. At the beginning of the sermon, I had mentioned about how oftentimes we sort of automatically assume that the writers of the Bible were these brains on sticks or these androids or cyborgs. I can't remember which is which. Where they look human, but they are robots on the inside. They don't experience life like we do. And we just kind of automatically assume that real spiritual, real holy people are like that because maybe there's this fear inside of us that, you know, if the, for me to be in the presence of God, for me to have the peace of God in my life, means that I will never deal with fear or I will never deal with anxieties. Or, or even if I'm content, does that mean my life won't be easy? So often we come to the Bible, and maybe it's because we've been fed a steady stream of Christian music or books or devotionals where we kind of just say, if I do X, Y, and Z, then God will reward me with an easy life. If I just, if I just, uh, if I plug A into B, God will reward me with his peace that will last forever and it will never go away. But Paul says he has learned to be content in every situation. If you read through 2 Corinthians, chapters uh, 4, well, all of it, but chapter, especially 4 through 11, Paul boasts. And this is what's crazy because it's so countercultural. It's so against the grain of how you would want to convince people that you were somebody worth following, that you had, this, you had the knowledge of the true God. The way that he does that is that he boasts in his sufferings beaten, shipwrecked, imprisoned, humiliated, despairing to the point where you feel like you are living in death. Paul points to his suffering. And then later on in Philippians, he writes about it in the terms of this is where I learned this as the key to learning to be content. And again, this isn't just, this isn't a, a, sort of a, oh, that wasn't really suffering, it wasn't really that bad. Um, I've been reading a lot of a scholar uh, by the name of N.T. Wright, and he says, as various writers have observed, the popular philosophies aimed at a kind of self-sufficient, either getting rid, either through getting rid of everything troublesome, or by explaining that the trouble wasn't real, that, that it's, excuse me, let me, I'll reread that again. As various writers have observed, the popular philosophers aimed at a kind of self-sufficiency either through getting rid of everything troublesome or by explaining that the trouble wasn't real, that it couldn't affect one's real self, Paul would have none of that. Suffering was suffering, and it mattered as such. Paul says that he learned to be content through suffering, not pretending it wasn't real, not just by choosing to look on the bright side, but even in trusting in God and enduring that suffering, he has learned to be content. It is anchored in and energized in Christ's resurrection power. You see, that's what Paul has been saying all throughout this, this letter in Philippians and the rest of his letters is that the, the, the way he has learned to be content is not to just choose to look on the bright side of things. It's not to be, choose to be thankful. It's not to choose to believe that this really isn't so bad, but it's to actually go deeper into the life of Jesus. That it is actually through associating with Jesus in his suffering that he comes to know Jesus even more. And he warns followers of Jesus slash promises them that if you do that too, you will come to know Jesus more. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection to even share in his sufferings so that I might become like him. So this contentment that Paul is talking about is not a detached stoicism, but in all things that he is able to demonstrate the mind of Christ through demonstrating Jesus' love in his life. Contentment is not detached stoicism where we pretend like everything is okay, where real life situations and emotions don't bother us, 
But even in that, even in that suffering and that, that discomfort, we are able to demonstrate the mind of Christ by demonstrating the life of Christ, the love of Christ. And that even when those situations in our life that cause us suffering may not be directly related to our faith in Jesus, like Paul's in these, in these situations were, maybe there's something going on in your life that is, for the lack of a better word, having nothing to do with your faith in Jesus. It, you're not suffering because, you know, you're a follower of Jesus, but because you are a follower of Jesus, the mind of Christ and the life of Christ has everything to do with how you respond to that situation. Are you able to demonstrate what Paul talks about, the worthy life, loving and serving one another, considering their needs before your own, doing all things without grumbling or complaining, pursuing holiness so that you can be shown as what it looks like for God's spirit to live in somebody even in, in non-religious suffering cases, God still, uh, still allows us to grow in our faith in Christ and to become more like him. He says, I can do all of these things through him who gives me strength. We know that passage if you've grown up in the church. It's everywhere on inspirational posters. You hear it after a well-known Christian wins the big game. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Students trying to convince their parents that they don't need to study because we can pass this test because they can do all things through, through Christ who strengthens us. And yet all of this is not just everything that we want to accomplish in our life, but is ultimately about the extremes of life that we will experience as followers of Jesus. So as we conclude this main part of the sermon passage, we talk about this idea of learning the secret of contentment. It's not a detached, holy stoicism where we pretend like everything is okay or it doesn't really matter because this disembodied spiritual place called heaven is our home. And it's not about just sort of choosing to be thankful, even though that is a major part of it, but rather the contentment is pursuing the mind and life of Christ so that we can become like him even in our suffering. And that takes time. It's not just a, if I plug A into B, boom, there it is. It takes time. It takes experience. It takes intentionality. And here's the thing. As much as it takes the, the spirit of God in your life through a personal relationship with Jesus, it also takes each other. Paul doesn't want us to learn the secret of contentment on our own, but rather what he wants to do is he wants us to pursue this together. As he goes on in this last portion, he says, Yet it was good for you to share my troubles. Moreover, you as Philippians know that in the early days of the acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving or receiving, except you. And you did it multiple times. Not that I desire your gifts, but what I desire more is for it to be credited to your account. I have received full payment and I have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received Epaphroditus the gifts that you have given. They are a fragrant offering, acceptable and pleasing to God. We had talked about earlier about how that is saying, like, it is an, it, we are able to worship God through this. And he's saying, we're doing this together. This isn't just about me and Jesus reading the Bible in my own personal quiet time, but this is about us pursuing and living out the life of Jesus together. In 2 Corinthians, Paul actually talks about the way that God comforted him in chapter 7 was through sending other Christians into their life. They had no rest. They were harassed at every turn. Conflicts on the ins outside, and get this, get this, get this, fears on the inside. They were afraid. And what does God do? Does he give some sort of super spiritual, you know, ray up from heaven to where everything's okay? No, he sends another Christian into their life so that they are able to encourage one another and bear one another's burdens. So how do we get out of this concept of self-centric despair? If you want to think about it in terms of our motto, we experience the love of God through faith in Christ, and we embody it towards one another.
I'll conclude this message with a couple quotes from Jay Kim. He says, self-centric despair fossilizes us in a permanent posture of receiving. Hands open, palms up, awaiting morsels of warm feelings that will drip in, and, drip in now and then, but eventually die from atrophy. But love in motion, genuine and meaningful love on the move prevents decay. We believe the way out of the deep, dark pit of self-centered self despair is a rope pulling us up. In reality, that way is a ladder. As we take every single step, step after step, by receiving and giving love each along the way, this is what it means for love to be a vocation. And so, friends, as we wrap up the, the letter of Philippians, we are reminded that as much as Paul calls individuals to, to trust and believe Jesus as themselves, he calls them to do it together. And he says, and my God will meet all of your needs in accordance to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To God be the glory, to God and Father be the glory forever. God will meet all of your needs. We think about it in the context of Philippians. Living a worthy life, rejoicing in all things, living a cross-shaped life, shining like stars, and fighting and finding for peace and contentment. God will supply those needs through his spirit and one another according to his riches. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that, again, the gospel message is one of coming and receiving not earning, not bringing our checklist of accomplishments, but coming and receiving. So as we continue to worship you today, we ask that you would give us, through your spirit, eyes to see what it means to pursue contentment, not to eliminate worries in this life, but even in those worries that we would be able to pursue the mind of Christ and the life of Christ. Help us, God, because we know we can't do this apart from your spirit. But as the Philippians says, you will provide all of our needs. We love you, Lord, because of your love for us.